Hello, and welcome to a deep dive into AWS Graviton 3 and the Amazon C7G instances. My name is Ali Saidi. I'm a senior principal engineer in AWS and the lead engineer for our Graviton instances. And joining me today is Jonathan. He's an AVP of technology at DirecTV. Jonathan's going to talk about how DirecTV moved a number of services uh, to Graviton. But first, I'm going to talk about our new Graviton instances, um, some of the customer success stories we've seen around Graviton and the uh, momentum in the ARM software ecosystem, our next-gen Graviton 3 processor. I'm going to talk a lot about that, how that comes together to form the seventh generation of EC2 C7G instances. Then Jonathan's going to talk for a bit, and I'm going to wrap up. We've been innovating in silicon across three major areas in AWS. The first is the AWS Nitro system, where we took components of a hypervisor. That's the piece of software that takes a big machine and cuts it into virtual machines, and started moving it onto special purpose chips that accelerated I.O., that raised the bar in security, and that let you use all of the resources on that host processor for, for your processing. The other two areas we've, uh, we've been investing in are Graviton, Graviton 2 and Graviton 3 now, powerful and efficient um, host compute, and also our machine learning chips, Inferentia for inference and, and Trainium for, for training, which both cut the cost of inference and training in your apps and are more efficient than other solutions. Building our own chips really lets us innovate um, at a wide variety of layers on behalf of you faster, raise the bar on security, and deliver more value. And those are the reasons that we end up doing this. On the innovation side, being able to build the silicon, the server it goes into, and ha having the teams that, do the, that write the software for that all under one roof means there's faster innovation, and we can cut across traditional boundaries. I'm going to take this off, sorry. Um, we also can build chips um, for our needs. We can specialize them for what we're trying to do. We don't have to add features that other people want. We can just build them for the, the things that we think are going to provide the most value to our customers and ignore the ones that really aren't. The third is speed. We get to control the start of the project, the schedule, and the delivery. And we can paralyze the hardware and software development and use the massive scale of our cloud to do all the simulations required to build a chip. And lastly, operations. We have a lot of insight into operations, running EC2, and we can put features into our chips to do things like refresh the firmware to address an issue or enhance functionality without disturbing the customers running on the machine. ARM processors are ubiquitous around us. For years, they've powered the phones and tablets that we use every day. They're also starting to show up in laptops and with Graviton servers. Our Graviton processors have targeted optimizations to reduce costs and power consumption, which means they're less expensive to operate, and we get to pass that cost savings onto you. We're now in our third generation of Graviton. We announced the first one back in 2018. In 2019, the second with a substantial performance increase, and now we're here with the third with another substantial increase. Today, we have Graviton instances available in 12 different types and across 23 different regions. We started with the M6G instance, and since then, we've expanded the portfolio of instances to, for the compute optimized C6G and C6GD. Last year, we announced C6GN, which adds 100 gig of networking, elastic fabric adapter, and higher EBS performance. We have our R6G and R6GD instances for memory-intensive workloads. And customers came to us and said, we're able to pack so many things um, into an instance if we only had some more memory. So with that, we created X, uh, the X2GD with 16 gigs of RAM for every vCPU. We have a burstable type, T4G, and there's still a free trial on that for the end of the year. So you can spin up an instance through the end of December, and, and uh, we cover the bill. The, we've announced two different, uh, sorry, three different instances this week at reInvent. The first are two storage ones, IM4GN and IS4GEN, which provide the lowest cost uh, per terabyte of SSD storage in EC2 or the best price performance in EC2, depending on, on the one. We also have G5G, which is the first time we've taken a Graviton CPU 
and coupled it with an NVIDIA GPU. As I mentioned with IM4GN, we have up to 40% better price performance compared to our i3 instances. And with IS4GEN, um, we have the lowest cost per terabyte of any of our, our um, storage-focused instances. Both of these feature our new Nitro SSDs. Which, these are custom-designed SSDs where we talk to customers and we ask them what would make their storage instances better. And a lot of the answers we got were, if you can reduce the tail latency of, of I.O. requests, not necessarily increase the IOPS or increase the bandwidth, but just reduce the tail latency, they can push more requests through the system and meet their SLA goals, and that'll lower their costs. And so that's what we focused on here. One of the customers that's been, been um, trying the IM4GN and IS4GN is Splunk. Splunk's a leading data platform provider, and it's designed to investigate, monitor, analyze, and act on data at any scale. And when they moved from i3 and i3ENs to, to our new Graviton-based instances, they saw a 50% decrease in search runtime, or up to a 50% decrease in search runtime, and significant price performance improvements there. The other instance that we just announced is the G5G. Here we have an NVIDIA uh, T4 Tensor Core GPU paired with a Graviton CPU. And together, this makes the most cost-effective GPU-based platform in EC2 for graphics applications, machine learning inference. And one of the big use cases we found here is Android game developers wanting to do development, testing, or streaming of their games to end users. One of those is Canonical. Canonical has a product called Anbox, and they've been using these instances. They found they can stream 55 different sessions from one machine at 30 FPS, and it ended up being 20% less expensive than the, the instances they were using previously. So how can you use Graviton? Well, Graviton is supported by major Linux distributions like Amazon Linux, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, SUSE, Ubuntu, and others, as well as FreeBSD and NetBSD. And of course, containers. We have a lot of customers running containers on Graviton, building um, multi-arch containers that support both x86 and ARM and deploying them to either Graviton or x86 instances. Um, by running Kubernetes themselves, using EKS or ECS. And just last week, we announced Fargate support uh, for Graviton as well. Another exciting announcement that, that we have here is for people who are looking to, to develop HPC applications on, on Graviton, the NVIDIA HPC SDK is going to be available as part of AWS Parallel Cluster in 2022. Um, and this gives us two things. First, uh, HPC applications really require specialized compilers and analysis tools because they're looking at visualizing thousands of processes and hundreds of nodes. And the second is optimizations. Uh, an HPC compiler might be more aggressive in certain optimizations than a general purpose compiler would be, specifically around um, loop vectorization, for example. And so next year, the NVIDIA HPC SDK will be available as part of AWS Parallel Cluster for Graviton, not just for our GPU instances, but even for all of our Graviton instances. And you'll get seamless integration with um, our EFA software. And different benchmarks have shown as much as 80% higher performance using those compilers versus GCC and G4 trend. Perhaps the easiest way to, uh, to utilize Graviton is to use some of our managed services we now have support for Graviton and DocumentDB, Amazon Aurora, RDS, ElastiCache, MemoryDB, and, and most recently, Neptune. And in a lot of these cases, actually, Graviton's become the default. If you don't specify an instance type, you'll end up getting a Graviton instance. Also in our analytics tools, we have OpenSearch and EMR that both support Graviton. A few months ago, Lambda announced support for Graviton, and just this last week, both Fargate and Elastic Beanstalk now support our Graviton instances. Also, um, a couple days ago, Amazon's FSX for Lustre and OpenZFS announced that part of that solution will be Graviton-based. 
There's also some other exciting news um, that came out yesterday that SAP HANA Cloud, which is a fully managed in-memory cloud database as a service, is working with, with us to port um, or to power SAP HANA Cloud on Graviton processors going forward. This week, we also announced the Graviton Ready program. And this is certified partner solutions for use on Graviton, where there are supported offerings, including operating systems, platform services, security, monitoring, CICD, analytics, and cloud devices. And these partners run QA of their software and, and offer optimized products that are equivalent, be it a Graviton system or another system. And this makes it easy for you to discover agents and, and other solutions that will just work out of the box easily. We've seen a huge number of customers adopt Graviton, from large enterprises to startups across different verticals and segments and geographies, either directly through EC2 instances or through the managed services that I just talked about. Typically, people start by migrating single workload. And they see that actually the effort might be less than they expected. And they get some price performance benefits. And then starting moving an increasing number of workloads. Jonathan's going to tell you a bit about direct TV streams uh, experience there. But we've also seen people like Discovery, who used Graviton-based instances to reach 175 million viewers during the Tokyo Olympics. Epic, who's running Fortnite and the Unreal Engine on Graviton. Formula One, who found 40% lower cost, running computational fluid dynamics on Graviton. And Lyft, who uses a combination of Python and, and Go and saw 30% better price performance. To help customers move their first workload, over the summer we had a Graviton challenge, which provided some step-by-step -step blueprints for, for adopting Graviton and, and kind of broke down the tasks into four steps. The first was just to learn and explore about Graviton and find the dependencies of your application, then plan and port it, create a development environment, try to make the code build. The third step was to debug it, optimize it, measure performance, and lastly, to deploy it in whatever appropriate mechanism, like a blue-green deployment. There was also a, a contest and a hackathon that went along with it. Um, so we saw lots of customers uh, open source developers, startups, and enterprises all participate. Um, all in all, I think there was about 1,000 people who participated. And some of the, uh, the winners are VMware's vRealize IT team. They moved a, a service to Graviton and saw 40%, 48% latency reduction and a 20% cost savings. And a startup, Chasm Technologies, moved a VDI workload that did like uh, browser sandboxing and isolation. And um, they also saw 25% cost savings. One of my favorite um, tweets on the subject is really um, Grant Lammy here, who tweeted that he tried it. He changed the instance type in his app config for EMR and ended up saving 20% 20, 20 as well as being 12% faster. Sometimes people ask me about scale. Who's using Graviton at scale? And most customers don't want me to tell you the scale that they're using of any particular instance type. But during Prime Day back in June, Graviton powered 12 different core retail services, including one called DataPath. Now, DataPath is a, is a database that, that also does computation in it. And in terms of scale, they ran over 53,000 instances during Prime Day. So that can give you some idea of some people who, like, the scale at which Graviton can be adopted. OK, so we've talked about Graviton in the past. Now let me talk about Graviton 3. This is a picture of a Graviton 3 CPU. You can see here um, that there's something a little different about it. It's got seven different die on the, in that chip. Um, and I'll go into what those do in a couple minutes. But there's over 50 billion transistors in Graviton 3 up from 30 billion in Graviton, uh, in Graviton 2. So we put a lot more comp compute into that die. Overall, there's 25% higher performance per core versus Graviton 2. And Graviton 3 is the first system we have with DDR5 in our data centers, which gives us 50% more DDR bandwidth. 
Graphton 3 runs at a slightly faster clock, but it gets most of its performance by extracting more instructions per cycle, or IPC. That 30 to over 50 billion transistors, most of them went into the cores. We made the core a lot bigger. It's got a 2x wider front end, a much bigger branch predictor that predicts branches for larger workloads, almost 2x wider dispatch, a 2x larger instruction window, twice the SIMD performance. It also supports SVE and bfloat16. There's 2x the memory operations, including some enhanced prefetchers and twice the number of outstanding transactions from each of the cores. There's 2x the um, ALUs and multipliers, and the multipliers are wider. And that means that um, you can, things like RSA, TLS session negotiations are a lot faster. And finally, we have both pointer off, um, which is a technology to, to sign uh, pointers and, and, and confirm that the, the, the pointer was signed, which stops attacks like um, return oriented programming and an RNG instruction. One thing that makes Graviton quite different than the other instances that we offer is that every vCPU you get is a full-blown core. There's no SMT or hyper-threading. None of the resources like the L1 or L2 caches or parts of the pipeline in the core are shared. So on one of our x86 instances, you have these hyper-threads or, or, or simultaneous multi-threads. And the as instructions flow through the pipeline, they contend in the, in the execution resources and in the caches. And sometimes this is, this is good in that you get to fill in some of the, the holes in the execution stream. Other times, you end up just extending the, uh, the execution. On our Graviton instances, since every vCPU is a physical core and there's no SMT, there's no, um, n none of that interference in the cores or in the caches. One of the things customers loved about Graviton 2 was there were no NUMA domains. NUMA stands for non-uniform memory architecture. It really is the question of, is the path from the core to memory the same, or is there a kind of near memory and far memory? And most people don't think about that, don't know how to determine if that's going to be, like, where their data versus where their processing is. So they leave it up to the OS. And the OS has really imperfect information. It doesn't really know. So, when you get the case that the, the cores and the memory are co-located, things are great. And when they're not, it gets slower. So when we decided we wanted to do multiple die, we started with the premise of we were going to put all the cores together. So there was no NUMA domains. And then we stitched them together with a, a mesh that runs it over uh, 2 gigahertz and has more than 2 terabytes a second of bisection bandwidth. We then distributed a cache throughout that, uh, that mesh. It's 32 megabytes, and that cache, along with all the caches and the cores, means there's 100 megabytes of user accessible cache on the chip. Then we added our DDR controllers. Those are the, the four chips you, seed, you saw on the sides uh, there in the, in the picture on the right. These are DDR4800 controllers, and they have over 300 gigabytes a second of theoretical memory bandwidth. And just like Graviton 2, it's easily accessible memory bandwidth. You write simple loops on the cores, and you get 80% of that without any heroics or special instructions. And just like Graviton 2, all the memory is also encrypted. We also support PCIe up to Gen 5, and that's what those two bottom dies are for. Now, I talked about the CPU, but we have end-to-end -end ownership here. And it, in a data center, you have racks, and in the racks, you have servers. And for every rack, there's, it's usually about 42U tall. And there's a certain amount of provision power for that rack. In an ideal world, you'd fill the rack and you'd use all the power um, at that rack position. That would be the most efficient solution. Um, now, with a lot of systems that are data centers, we, don't actually get, we can't actually fill the rack. They consume all the power before they consume all the space. So we run out of, uh, we run out of power first. But with Graviton and Graviton 3, uh, we run out of space before power. We'd like to put more in a rack, at least if we build it with two sockets. So what can we do? Well, we took a kind of a basic server design that has two sockets and, a, in our case, a nitro card. 
and said, why do we actually need two? Let's build a package, the motherboard, and the entire chassis to fit three. So we have three Graviton 3 side by side. That increases the sockets per rack by 50%. It comes closer to the power requirements we see from other vendor solutions. And our latest generation of Nitro Card is able to manage all three of those sockets simultaneously. With that, we better balance the space and the power we consume at each rack position and end up delivering a more efficient, efficient solution. So with that, we have our seventh generation of EC2 instances with Graviton 3 CPUs, DDR5 memory, um, and we found that they use up to 60% less energy for the same performance than some of the comparable EC2 instances we have. And this means they're gonna have the best price performance in EC2 as well. There's a preview for C7G now, and you can sign up for it at the, the URL here. It's also linked in, uh, in Jeff Barr's blog on C7G if you can't capture it right now. So what about performance? Let's talk about Graviton performance for a few minutes. So the first thing that I'm gonna share is spec CPU um, 2017 rate. So this is where we're running a copy of spec CPU on all the vCPUs in the system. We think that's closer to a real performance by running all the vCPUs than only running, for example, one since uh, people don't typically buy a large machine and then only use one of them. Spec contains a bunch of benchmarks, including things that do compilation, Sudoku solving, weather prediction, and others. And on the integer side of that, you can see we have 27% higher performance versus Graviton 2, and on the FP side, almost 60%. For the rest of these, I'm just gonna compare versus Gra Graviton 2 versus Graviton 3. Um, and the next one, I'm gonna talk about load balancing with Nginx. So uh, Nginx is a load balancer or a web server as well. And here, we have a load generator. We're using the open source load generator work to generate uh, 512 clients worth of HTTPS connections through Nginx and then to load balance them onto a number of web servers. The load generator's fixed and the web server's fixed. We just choose, are we gonna run a C6G uh, 2XL or a C7G 2XL instance for Nginx. In doing this, we saw almost a 2X increase in performance um, on a 2XL size. When you get to a larger size like a 4XL, it, it gets a little, a little bit less, but still, it's a huge number. Similarly, we looked at a Node.js application, in this case, Acme Air. It's a sample application that does flight scheduling. and We ran one copy of Node.js per vCPU, used Nginx as a reverse proxy, um, fixed the database in the load generator again, and we find 37% higher performance on Nginx from Graviton 2 to Graviton 3. There's a lot of video being transmitted across the internet, um, and encoding that is a large portion of memory cloud-based workloads. And so here we used uh, libx264 to encode some uncompressed video um, with a very slow preset for the highest quality. And we see 49% more frames per second are encoded on the Graviton 2 system versus the, or sorry, the Graviton 3 system versus the Graviton 2 one. I'm a big fan of F1. Uh, I like to watch the races with my son and, and marvel at engineering excellence. And part of that is they do a lot of computational fluid dynamics to see how the cars and the downforce works on the cars and how it disturbs the air behind the cars. Now, F1 already saw that, that the C6GN instances save them around 40% by doing their CFD simulations uh, on, on those. C7G reduces that, that uh, runtime by another 40%. It's 40% faster. Um, and so uh, Pat Simmons, who's the CTO of, of Formula One Management, thinks that um, C6 G, sorry, C7 Gs will, uh, will be the optimal choice for all their CFD workloads. Lastly, I want to talk a bit about machine learning. Um, here I'm looking at a natural language processing workload using a BERT model and a question and answer task. And Graviton 2 has, two, or, sorry, I keep, I'm too used to saying Graviton 2. Graviton 3 has um, two different uh, enhancements for machine learning. The first is bfloat16, 
which um, gives you the same width as an FP32 number, but less precision. And we have twice the SIMD width. So we combine those together, we end up seeing about two and a half X higher performance on this BERT workload. And if you were looking at uh, CNN like ResNet, it's closer to, to 3X or, or even over 3X. Now, beyond just uh, kind of the numbers that we've looked at, Epic Games has gotten to test a C7G and, and they say they're suitable for the most demanding latency sensitive workloads while providing significant price performance benefits and expanding what's possible with, with in Fortnite and any Unreal Engine created experience. Similarly, um, Twitter tested a C7G instance as well. And they used a number of benchmarks that they found to be representative of, of their internal workloads and found between 20 and 80% higher performance as well as reducing tail latencies by as much as 35%. And lastly, Honeycomb, Liz at Honeycomb um, saw that they used about 30% fewer instances um, on the C7G over a C6G, and they also got 30% reduced latency. So I hope you'll sign up for the, the Graviton 3 preview program. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Jonathan, and he's gonna tell you about um, DirecTV Stream's adoption journey of Graviton 2. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, as Ollie said, I'm Jonathan Tronson. I'm part of the technology team at DirecTV. And for the last part of our session today, I'm gonna to be talking about how we adopted Graviton2, specifically for DirecTV Stream and our microservice platform that runs in AWS. So my presentation is sort of broken down to three parts. I'm gonna to touch upon DirecTV and DirecTV Stream, our microservice platform that I mentioned that's in AWS, and then dive into the code changes and process changes we made to our components to adopt Graviton2. Uh, I'm gonna do a short demo, and then uh, go over our takeaways and lessons learned uh, from our journey. So uh, DirecTV and DirecTV Stream allows our millions of customers to watch their favorite live TV, uh, including sports, regional sports, uh, local news, premium uh, VOD content, uh, in-home and on their mobile devices. And our microservice platform that runs in AWS uh, supports those two products. Uh, and we built it over the last five years from scratch on both cloud native technologies and many AWS services that you're familiar with. And over the course of this uh, building platform, uh, we've grown to over 775 discrete microservices. And these services uh, are owned and operated by over 50 uh, development teams in our engineering organization. And on a typical day, our platform receives roughly 1.2 billion requests from our stream customers. And I'm gonna go over on the next slide here. There we go. Um, our platform team mission. And I, I'm sure there's many platform teams out there uh, and, and our, our goals and our objectives will probably sound very familiar to you. Um, we always look to improve and increase our security and reliability. We look to always lower our daily spend where we can. We try and help our dev teams go faster and do more. Uh, we're definitely looking to always automate our operations and our maintenance. And lastly, optimize our system performance. And so those probably sound pretty common to uh, all the platform teams out there. Um, unique to uh, our team is that uh, we're supporting a live TV platform. And what that means is essentially we have no opportunities for downtime. And so when we do uh, innovation uh, projects like adopting Graviton2, um, we, we have to take certain uh, things into consideration because uh, we have no, uh, no downtime available. Um, Another challenge is that uh, it has grown to a very large microservice catalog. And some of those microservices require a lot of CPU, 
or a lot of memory or a lot of I.O. We have very, uh, a, a, a various number of uh, workloads and use cases. And also, it, it's a pretty large uh, internal dev team uh, to support. In our favor, uh, when we're uh, looking at various innovations, uh, is that we already have a lot of automation in place. Uh, and we also have a dedicated developer experience team that can build really great tools for our developers. Um, and our uh, Kubernetes and CICD teams have grown to be very experienced in how to roll out new innovations, like adopting Graviton2. And we sort of had an internal innovation checklist. So when we look at, say, a new AWS service, uh, we want to make sure if, if we try and pull that in and, and make it available for our developers, will there be a high adoption rate? Will we be able to fail fast and roll back if we need to? Um, will there be a measurable benefit that we can actually socialize? And then we need to find dev team champions that will um, take these new innovations, try it out, and help socialize it with the greater dev community. Uh, lastly, we, we, we want to make sure these innovations, like adopting Graviton2, will, will be, uh, have low friction and low impact to our developers, and also it won't impact their ability to deliver features uh, to delay our customers. So before we uh, adopted Graviton2, uh, we've been in production since 2018 and our entire microservice fleet has been running exclusively on the C5 instance type. And this includes Kubernetes clusters, uh, more than a dozen spread across lab and production. And uh, we're a big user of uh, ECR for our image registry. We have over uh, many thousands of images in there. And those thousands of images typically run Spring Boot, Golang, and Node.js services. And lastly, uh, an interesting um, uh, metric is that we have over 25,000 pods uh, spread across lab and production. So in July, we were very inspired by Amazon's Graviton2 challenge. And so we decided, to, uh, I, I challenged my team, hey, let's, uh, let's go ahead and do this. Um, and we wanted to, um, with any large innovation project, sort of uh, use the, the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. And um, uh, we decided to focus on just our microservices that were written in Go. And can we take those and put those on Graviton as our uh, initial uh, effort? So before, before we uh, uh, began to uh, 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 replumb our entire uh, CI/CD lifecycle system to, to uh, support ARM64 and Graviton2, uh, we decided to do a, a quick and dirty fail fast proof of concept. So we took one service that was in production, we rebuilt it manually to support uh, ARM64, deployed it on a Graviton instance in lab, deployed it uh, on a uh, C6G instance in production, and just uh, made sure I, our hypothesis was, was, was gonna be correct and uh, that uh, the service would run uh, within our, our thresholds and our KPIs. So once we did that, then we started the sort of heavy lifting by looking at all the tools and processes we use uh, to uh, uh, build uh, microservices and, and test them and push them out to production. So some of the, the tools we looked at is uh, uh, for a developer, we, we, our developer experience team uh, built an a, a internal tool that allows developers to create microservices. And so we need to look at that and see how does that need to change to offer the developer the ability to, to, to target ARM64 and Graviton2. We also had to look at the actual structure of the microservice, the, the files and the libraries, and which of those had, had to change to, to be able to run on Graviton2. And then in terms of, of the, the CI pipeline, and, and we use Jenkins, uh, uh, what part of, uh, of that pipeline had to change and also, what did we need to change in order to push the image to ECR? 
Um, we, we use Spinnaker for our CD pipelines. And so we had to look at how, what parts of Spinnaker have to change in order to let Kubernetes know, hey, this, this image that was just built needs to run on Graviton rather than on a, a C5 instance type. And then lastly, we had to look at Kubernetes itself. What parts of Kubernetes do we need to change in order to have sort of a hybrid setup where we have some C5 instances and some C6G instances uh, cohabitating happily on the same Kubernetes cluster? So we sort of started digging in and uh, asking ourselves uh, questions. And, and so on, on, uh, on the, the microservice project itself, you know, we, we were thinking, all right, well, what changes are we gonna require uh, to our base image uh, and also to the starter project? Um, how will developers be given the choice to target Graviton to? Um, what build issues are we gonna encounter? So that was sort of an unknown. We have over 700 different microservice projects and we weren't sure how many uh, build issues we were, uh, we would see building these now on, on a new architecture. Um, and then we had to find a team willing to uh, take the, the plunge with us and, and take their service uh, that's been running fine and now put it on a new architecture, on a new instance type, and run it in production uh, with our live TV customers. And then, how are we gonna socialize the benefits uh, to the rest of the teams to get them excited about it uh, and spend uh, just some small amount of their time uh, to, uh, to uh, migrate their services over. Um, and then uh, another thing that we definitely spent time on is uh, we run a vanilla, uh, mainly vanilla Kubernetes uh, in, in lab and production. And, and so we need to really see what changes do we need to do so that we can have a set of Graviton nodes uh, uh, to our existing lab and production clusters. So uh, let's get into some of the actual changes we had to do. Uh, we created a dedicated auto scale group um, for a C6G Kubernetes node group. Um, we had to update our AMI bootstrap Docker container so that it would apply the correct taints and labels. And then also um, we created a, uh, we had to update our uh, Kubernetes worker AMI. Uh, we use the flat car alpha that's available uh, that supports ARM64. Uh, and we had to look at all the repos we use to make sure they offer multi uh, arch support. And there were a few that didn't, so we had to manually rebuild those. In the microservice project itself, we wanted to make a, a, a very small change uh, that developers had to do. So essentially, in their Jenkins file, we just added a simple single line uh, that let the build system know that the, the target build environment would be uh, uh, ARM64 and Graviton. And that, in turn, uh, allowed uh, Spinnaker uh, to use the proper Helm chart, which would render and hydrate the Kubernetes spec file with the, uh, the correct node selector and the toleration labels that I, I have on the slide. And then that would let Kubernetes know that this deployment is meant for the Graviton 2 nodes. Also, um, we're, we're, uh, since we're an ECR uh, user, uh, we want to take advantage of the OCI uh, art artifact support. And essentially what that means is we build two manifest files for the image, one for uh, x86 and one for ARM64. And then we merge that into a, a master uh, manifest, uh, upload that to ECR, and then that'll provide us a single URL and del deliver us the appropriate image for the architecture that we're running on at the, at the time. So once the service is on Graviton, uh, we, we wanted to uh, visually show our developers that yes, indeed, that service is, is now, uh, has been migrated. And so our management tool, which we built called kubedx, we added a new ARM64 label to the deployment um, visualization so that uh, the developer has sort of immediate feedback that their service has been migrated over. 
And let's talk about adoption rate. So again, we, we want to start by failing fast with one service and, and then start socializing that to more teams. And you can see by week 19, um, we're almost at 100 services, uh, production services moved over onto Graviton. And we uh, are very excited to hear about Graviton 3. And so we'll be, you know, as soon as that becomes available, we'll start migrating more onto Graviton 3. And uh, here you can see the, the, our sort of internal challenge we met. We were actually aiming to, to move 50 services over, and we actually moved 100 services over, uh, which it represents 25% of our live microservice catalog. And now I'm gonna show a demo. Uh, uh, this is a recording, and this will show essentially uh, how a developer will create a new microservice and how easy it is to target Graviton2 as the, the destination for their project. So here they're gonna click on uh, the area that says they wanna create a new microservice. They're gonna give it a name and a namespace. And then they're gonna choose our Go SDK and then they're gonna choose the target architecture. And so uh, uh, right now, uh, ARM64 is now the default architecture. And now the, our tool will then create their starter project in our code repo. It'll create a Jenkins CI pipeline, build the service, create an image, push it to ECR, and then Spinnaker is gonna take over uh, and, and create a CD pipeline and push it out to our lab in production. And so now the developer is gonna have the chance to examine the pods. It's gonna uh, choose one of the pods. It's gonna look at the log files to make sure it's actually running on a Graviton instance. And then it's all, uh, developer is also able to uh, hit a couple of endpoints. So here's our info endpoint, and then also inspect the Kubernetes deployment file to make sure the, the proper node selector in, in uh, uh, annotations are in there that lets Kubernetes know that that was meant for uh, Graviton2. So uh, lastly, our key takeaways uh, from, uh, from this work we, we did since July. Um, we definitely saw a fast adoption uh, once we got uh, everything plumbed out. And, and uh, like I said, we actually got 25% of our catalog migrated in just a few months. Uh, during that time, we saw no production impact to our live TV platform. And we definitely saw comparable performance and lower costs with the majority of the services. Um, it was a low impact change, uh, the, the pull request to the developer to, to uh, make the migration was very slight, just that single Jenkins file. And when we did see a hiccup, uh, it was very easy to roll back and, and figure out what's going on and then redeploy. And uh, what really helped us too was to find some dev champions uh, that were excited as we were to try Graviton2 and, and help socialize that to the greater community. So I'd like uh, to thank AWS for inviting uh, us to sort of share our journey and inspire more platform teams to, to do the same. And um, DirecTV Engineering is a very uh, exciting and, and fun domain uh, to work on. And, and so if, if you're passionate about uh, cloud development and AWS development, um, please uh, 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 visit uh, jobs.directtv.com or hit me up on LinkedIn or Twitter, and we'd be happy to talk to you more about uh, joining us. So uh, I'm gonna pass this back to Ali to wrap us up. Thanks, Jonathan. So in summary, Graviton3 delivers up to 25% higher energy performance, around 50% scientific performance and media encoding performance, and over 2x faster machine learning performance. Our new C7G instances extend the price performance leadership of our Graviton2 instances, and they're in preview now. Um, they'll be in GA in the coming months. And you can sign up for the preview here. I also put a couple of the getting started resources that we have for Graviton. Here. We have a GitHub page that has suggested compiler versions um, 
everything from particular languages and what we suggest for uh, compilation flags, uh, ISV support, and others. In there, there's also a performance runbook of if you have, if you are looking at performance, how you can compare it, how you can debug any performance anomalies that you might find, regardless of the architecture you're running on. And lastly, there are blogs, testimonials, and various other resources at the uh, Graviton2 landing page on AWS. So thank you for coming uh, and listening to, to our talk. And thank you, Jonathan, for, for um, sharing your experience and, and migrating with nearly 100 microservices to, to Graviton. That's really great. Um, please feel free to complete the session survey after the, the session ends. And 